Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And as Pilar mentioned, Fabian Telch is also done a lot of work on this work, um, as, as well as our, our colleague, Danielle Barragan, in Ecuador. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the case of Ecuador, right, in the last, in the 10 years under the Rafael Correa administration and some of the implications that unfolded during that period for civil society, specifically organized civil society, thinking civil society organizations. And what, um, today I'm kind of using you guys as a test run uh, for this a bit. We'll get to the case, but what in the paper, what Fabian, Danielle, and myself have done is tried to insert it in a framework around this idea of South-North cooperation. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit just to give you kind of what I'm thinking there. But this, the idea of this paper came about um, the day after the election in the US when um, Trump uh, uh, clearly won the, the election. Um, and some of my colleagues who do work for nonprofit organizations or with nonprofit organizations here in the US were starting to brainstorm what does this mean for civil society organizations working in different policy fields? What will the Trump administration, uh, what kind of implications will it have? And so we were talking a bit and I uh, immediately started reflecting on some of the work I've done in Ecuador um, because those same questions were being asked uh, once uh, Rafael Correa started in, in office and also started um, legislating uh, 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 essentially uh, with decrees um, targeting civil society organizations. So thinking about kind of what can uh, organizations in the US or even broader in the global north um, and the global south learn from Ecuador's experience. Um, and that's kind of how I'm framing this paper. But let me talk a little bit about some of um, the general research I do. Some of you might be familiar with Civicus, which is an uh, international alliance um, that essentially tracks civic space in, across all the countries in the world, right? And so when they think about civic space, they're thinking about um, freedoms related to fundamental rights of expression, association, and uh, peaceful assembly, right, across those measures. And so you see here they have a spectrum of closed to open and in between. And this just came out, this was updated, it's updated I think twice a year, it just came out last month in October. Um, 108 countries now uh, live in countries or have their civic space uh, categorized as obstructed, repressed, and closed, right? Uh, just 23 countries, and that's that kind of bright, bright green that in most are in Northern Europe. 23 countries now occupy that open category. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, the numbers show only 2% of the world's population live in countries where uh, civic space is considered open, right? So these are important issues in thinking about um, thinking about uh, the environments, the political, regulatory, and funding environments for civil society organizations. And so those are the kinds of questions that interest me. Almost all my research is around um, how are NGOs, non-governmental organizations, or civil society organizations responding to these shifting political, regulatory, and funding environments, right? And that was certainly the case in, in Ecuador when I uh, stumbled across Ecuador in terms of some of my dissertation research. Um, what else do I want to tell you about that? Oh, just a note on terminology. So um, it, depending on the audience, sometimes I say nonprofit organizations, sometimes I say non-governmental organizations or NGOs, and sometimes and more often I am saying civil society organizations because that's the term that's starting to be used more in Latin America for lots of reasons. One of the reasons is kind of the criminalization of the term NGO in the context of Latin America, specifically in the countries that I've looked at in Ecuador, um, even Peru, uh, uh, Bolivia, and Colombia as well. So I'll, I'll talk about it kind of more generally, civil society organizations and NGOs are in there, but there's a lot of other organizations that are included in that umbrella. Um, and I did present some of this work two weeks ago in Ecuador to an international uh, audience, but mostly to um, Latin Americanists and, and folks from Latin America. And so I'm kind of testing it on you. And so I'm interested to see what you guys will think about this. So let's go back to the issue at hand. So we frame this kind of, or we make the assumption that uh, people accept that there's this um, idea of po populism. There's a wave of populism going on in many different contexts, right? 
Um, and so we're kind of working under that assumption. Uh, thinking about populism and in the question and answer, uh, Fabian can certainly chime in because he did a, a majority of this framing in the paper. Um, thinking about it as a way of communicating, right? Um, this uh, a, a style of communication of political actors that calls against traditional power holders and um, elite, right? Um, it's considered in, in some circles to be a threat to pluralism in, in more liberal societies. And like I said, it is really a global phenomenon. We have examples, uh, Russia, Argentina, Italy, Venezuela, Ecuador, United States, arguably, um, and it really across the spectrum in terms of ideologically across the spectrum. And it's associated with different causes. It's kind of in reaction to diverting from the North in some cases. Um, certainly authoritarianism is, is related here. Um, and so in the paper, and this is where there might be some interesting discussion, we situate Rafael Correa and Trump at the, in the version now as populist leaders, as um, tending towards being that charismatic leader, um, perhaps authoritarian, and having populist tendencies. And this brought up a bit of debate, and so I'm curious what you, th what you think in, when we, in kind of question and answer. Other terms that folks have said that maybe is easier or better to use is authoritarianism right out flat. Um, in a proposal I put forth um, recently for a conference using this framework, I said authoritarian populism. So I've kind of just combined them both. So I'm curious what you think. But essentially, in terms of civil society, Korea, there are certainly differences. And we don't know still um, what's going to unfold in the Trump administration. It's um, uh, pretty new. Um, uh, but Korea, we have that 10 years. And Korea, there's really specific examples of attacks um, on civil society organizations specifically, which I'll talk about, and real threats to the freedom of, of speech in particular and expression. Trump, we're not sure, but implications um, or the implementation of some of his policies might trickle down to really affecting the fields in which um, civil society organizations work. And that's, of course, you can think about that immigration, um, healthcare, um, and, and the like. And so to further just show you this is not a systematic um, uh, collection, so to speak, of tweets and Facebook posts. But Trump and Korea, and we argue this in the paper, have a very similar style, and that we would argue that that's a populist um, uh, communication style. And so again, these are kind of organized in who's the target, right? Who's the other? So you have the othering, and then you have media, and then this idea of representing the people um, is something that was consistent in Ecuador. Um, with the term the mother country comes back, and then of course Trump's um, make America great again. And so the discourse and, and the style of these leaderships, even though arguably they might be on different ends of the ideological spectrum, perhaps, um, we would argue that this allows us to look at how civil society organizations responded in the times of Rafael Correa, and might there be lessons that can be applicable to the US or the global north more generally. And this is, and I'll kind of stop here to just talk about you know, the general aid assistance model, right? And aid broadly defined, thinking about all types of kinds of resources, is north-south cooperation, right? The north is providing resources to the south. And so um, that's shifting. And we might be, to use a provocative term, be entering into a post-aid world, right? And we can argue about that. But aid is shifting. And we see more attention given to South-South cooperation, right? Kind of pushing out the North completely or triangular cooperation where the North is still involved, but there's a pivot kind of in um, a, a country like Brazil um, or other kind of emergent economies and then a developing, so-called developing country. And then I would argue that we need to uh, put forth more attention into South-North, as I mentioned. That's the framework that I'm interested in. And there's lots of examples that you're probably familiar with um, of South-North cooperation. So to think about a few, um, participatory budgeting was something that was born out of Port, uh, Port, Porta, Porto Alegre in Brazil, and now has been adopted by over 1,500 uh, municipalities in the Global North and the Global South, right? That's something that has spread. The idea of participatory action research was came out of Colombia, this idea um, 
that combines research and theory with political participation. And that now is widespread in the global north and global south. Um, and even humanitarian assistance, even with its uh, geopolitical undertones uh, with uh, Hurricane Harvey, Venezuela, even given the context in which Venezuela is facing right now, um, worth $5 million and um, a certain amount of um, reserves of oil to help with some of the humanitarian relief. So South-North cooperation happens. And I think under this wave of populism and under these really the shrinking space of civil society that we're seeing across different contexts, global South and global North, that um, we can certainly learn from the Ecuadorian case. Um, okay. So the approach here, it's really the, this research is more of a commentary, um, but it's based on empirical research. So I've been doing research in Ecuador since 2009. And so from 2009 to 2016, I have 85 sit down formal um, interviews with civil society organizations, uh, not to mention all the informal, but really substantively rich conversations since I spent um, several periods of field work there, and then participation in lots of different kinds of meetings and workshops. And my, that, um, that, all that research is under this umbrella question of how do or how did uh, Ecuadorian civil society organizations respond to Correa government and policies. Um, and so that's where some of these, um, these lessons come out of. And so some of you might be familiar, certainly our Ecuadorian colleague, could be familiar with Correa's administration specific to um, the regulation of civil society and just the, the political discourse around civil society, organized civil society in particular. Um, we do have the, the um, constitution uh, which was rewritten in 2008 and does specifically note civil society and civil society organizations as vehicles um, and means to strengthen citizenship that is laid out. Um, along with many other types of provisions for participation um, and different types of rights. And you might be familiar with Ecuador being the first, first country to offer rights to nature, right, which got a lot of attention. Um, but from there, we see um, several different steps that the Korea um, administration took, several decrees. Um, and I won't get into all the details, but starting in 2018, this is when it really um, came out that Korea was going to start targeting civil society organizations, um, particularly through his discourse, but also through um, the executive decree 982, which um, had some provisions that were, that were maybe helpful, creating a, a centralized registry, creating more of a systematic process to register with line ministries, but also was criticized for having lots of discretion um, giving lots of discretion to uh, uh, public officials to request information, to question if an organization was um, adhering to its objectives, um, to essentially uh, 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 close an organization. There was uh, a lot of vague um, terminology and the, the concern was discretion. 2010, um, another pending regulation, which was never passed, but was even more of a clampdown, according to not just um, civil society organizations in Ecuador, but international, um, international bodies that were criticizing the Correa um, administration and using strong rhetoric like the party is over for NGOs. You know, this is ending, really linking NGOs to neoliberalism, linking NGOs and civil society organizations to, um, to international interest, etc. And then we have in 2013 and 15 uh, further regulations that um, opened up some opportunity for funding for civil society organizations, but that was never actually implemented. Um, but again, was criticized for its discretion for um, um, its provision that said if any organizations disturb the peace is the quote, and what does it was that was not defined, and so it was quite vague. Now, the interesting news is last week the current administration put out a new decree, which um, civil society organizations are very hopeful about. But this paper is really about Korea. But um, so there is some hope. And uh, like I said, I was there a couple weeks ago. And people seem to think that the new administration was much more open to conversations and dialogue with organized civil society. OK, so that's some background. I can get into more specifics if people are interested or have questions. But you have um, 
you have kind of the perfect storm here with the Korea administration. You have some really tough political discourse targeting civil society. You have regulation changing, reforms happening that again is targeting civil society. And then this other backdrop of um, because of geopolitical issues or just because of the shifting changes in age, you have funding of civil society organizations drying up, right? So this is the perfect storm for civil society organizations um, to take action. And so what we've done is um, we have kind of four lessons, and I'm going to provide these lessons with some illustrative, um, illustrative examples, and then we can kind of open it up for further discussion. So, so the lesson one, because I should look at my notes so I'm not totally off script. Um, lesson one, this is important and not surprising really. Under the Korea administration, this isn't, shouldn't be earth shattering, organizations representing specific policy areas were certainly targeted, right? And these were organizations defending rights of nature, indigenous rights, uh, freedoms of expression. These types of organizations were uh, specifically targeted and they were most often working in these really contentious policy areas in Ecuador, women's, indigenous, cultural, rural, environmental and media rights, right? And those are those, those are thorny issues in the context of uh, Ecuador in particular, but um, elsewhere as well. And so I'll give you, a, you know, this first started in 2009, 2009 after that first decree um, and an organization which has international acclaim for working for indigenous and environmental rights called Acción Ecológica was told by the Ministry of Health that it was no longer to... Uh, it was no longer able to, um, to function in Ecuador legally, not able to legally operate. And um, it was shut down. And it ended up being shut down for two weeks. And part of the issue was that it had been registered under the Ministry of Health. It had been um, created in the late 1980s. Um, and the Ministry of Environment did not exist in the late 1980s. And so um, government essentially explained that it was not properly registered as it was registered in the, the Ministry of Health. Um, that and that given the, the new decree, 982, it was not fulfilling its written objectives, again, because it was registered in, in health and not um, the, envi the Environment Ministry, which again was not in existence in 1980. Um, this received lots of international attention. Um, it was a, essentially international actors and Acción Ecológica um, said it wasn't necessarily about kind of the, these legal provisions, but it was related to this debate that was happening in 2009 related to the mining law. At the time, Acción Ecológica was supporting a peasant and indigenous protest against these large scale uh, mining. And so they were feeling attacked based on, based on that action. And it escalated politically. At one point, Acción Ecológica was um, one of the Korea administration's uh, biggest fans, in particular about um, including the rights of nature in the constitution. But then this really shifted them to be considered one of its most charged critics. And so it lasted two weeks, got a lot of international attention, um, and then essentially um, under pressure, the government then just directed their legalization process to the Ministry of, of, of Environment as they, they stated that that was the most appropriate. One other example is uh, Fundacion Pachamama. Um, Pachamama, and this is jumping ahead, 2013. Um, this is an organization that had worked in um, indigenous rights, environmental rights, um, human rights more generally. And um, it became in 2013, uh, quote, this is a Pachamama leader, an uncomfortable actor for the government because again, it was supporting like Acción Ecológica, some protests um, by indigenous and, and, and peasant movements uh, related to the extraction of oil. And there, um, this was a case where actually the protests did end up um, resulting in some uh, unrest, so to speak. There was an ambassador from Chile um, and uh, 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 um, an oil executive that were uh, physically um, assaulted in a, in a protest, but Pachamama wasn't necessarily leading the protest, but was associated and, and was 
the organizational entity that the Korea government could pinpoint. And so their um, legal personality, their legal status was revoked um, and it was shut down late um, in December 2013. Again, using the decree at that time, which was um, 016, um, saying that it was disturbing the peace, right? Um, and so that organization um, is not working under the name of Pachamama, and I'll come back to that in a second. So specific policy areas are targeted. Um, this is something that uh, civil society in Ecuador learned very quickly, starting right with the Acción uh, Ecológica, but has continued. And there are other examples, but for purposes of time, I won't, um, I won't share those. But another lesson, um, and this is not, I wouldn't say, um, surprising either, um, that these organizations, um, given the reality of threats of closure and, and closure, organizations um, use kind of this rights-based framework to defend themselves. Um, and so some examples, um, the, there is a network of women's and in, indigenous and rural organizations in Chimborazo, which is um, uh, in, in the, the Sierra of Ecuador. And they, in 2000, again, going back to 2009, after the first decree came out, um, really uh, spoke out um, publicly and had several open letters to the government and the public explaining that this, these new regulations for civil society were actually excluding them from um, participating in civil society. And this was really focusing on the registry. There was an online registry. and. Um, the groups argued that with the limited and sometimes no access to technology, that this further excludes them for, from participating um, in, in local and national affairs. And so um, they essentially took their case to um, the, the Constitutional Court. This was a bit symbolic. It stuck there for several years. Nothing happened beyond that. Um, but they took it to um, the the constitutional court, court, and then they really did a campaign, like a public campaign about all the wrongs with decree um, 982. And this is um, explaining that people are, are, are just giving up on organizing and having legal status. And their argument was really that to be heard locally in local government affairs, that they needed to have legal status, but that this registry now was preventing them to have that legal status. So again, was excluding them. Um, Acción Ecológica also used a constitutional rights framing, also um, brought lawsuit to the Korea administration. It was more symbolic. Um, it's, it's stuck there at the constitutional court. But they used a different framing in the sense that they really highlighted a specific article in the Constitution that obligates Ecuadorians to hold up the Constitution. And so they were essentially um, arguing that if they, as a group of Ecuadorians, were not allowed to fight for rights that are provided in the Constitution, that this was actually violating that, artic that Article um, 83. Um, so human rights framing, this is a really important tool. Um, and again, more symbolic in terms of lawsuits, but certainly um, open letters and even um, campaigns of sorts uh, ensued really highlighting um, the issues around not only the rhetoric, but specifically the regulation. This um, lesson, I think, could be perhaps a very applicable one to different contexts and that I want to explore further. And this idea of organizations um, being nimble and agile and being able to change and reconfigure um, in terms of organizations. So, we have um, specifically the segments that have been targeted in Ecuador, you know, indigenous rights, women's rights, environmental rights, um, essentially kind of reconfiguring how they do organize civil society. Um, and so one example is the Confederation of, of Ecuadorian uh, Civil Society Organizations. And this was started as first as a collective of civil society organizations that came together in reaction and concern to the first decree in 2008, right? This was, these were organizations that generally worked in development, were internationally funded, although not all, but had international funds and then also worked with more community-based organizations, specifically in Ecuador. 
they came together. It was a small group at first, and they started producing some information, um, started explaining the significance of civil society and what civil society has contributed, um, and essentially started meeting in reaction um, and to defend themselves as civil society organizations. And so approximately after uh, four years, in 2003, they actually created the Confederation of Ecuadorian civil society organizations. And this had never happened. And confederations, national level, and even um, subnational level federations are, are common in, in a lot of, well, even in the US and um, certainly in Latin America. But in Ecuador, that had never been um, something that, uh, that took shape. And this was um, clearly uh, a reason to create this new organization that would essentially be able to collectively um, defend civil society and some of civil society's uh, functions. Um, another one which is interesting is the closing of Pachamama, as I mentioned in 2013. They're still working, but they're working under a different name, and that is Terra Mater. And so uh, as um, explained in 2016 when I talked to one of the Pachamama leaders, um, quote, we are now Terra Mater. It is not a nonprofit organization. It is more of an association. But dealing with the same themes, it has notarized statues and reports to the Internal Revenue Service, but it does not have legal status, nor is it registered as a nonprofit organization uh, in a line ministry. And so they're avoiding um, being under that umbrella of nonprofit organizations or NGOs in Ecuador that needs to be registered. And they're um, doing really interesting work. Part of the challenge of this is that some of their funders, both domestic and international, want to see them have more of a legal status. You know, that is, a, um, is part of the system of aid and assistance. And so they're working around that. Some governments in particular and other international funders are trying to be a little more nimble and not necessarily need that legal registration. Um, but I think that's, um, that's an evolving, evolving um, an evolving question in terms of what does this mean when civil society abandons some of its old uh, forms and, and has new ones. And then the last one is um, Yasunidos. And this is um, an interesting one, also linked to indigenous rights. It's a collective. And it was created in 2013 in response, and some of you might be familiar with this, uh, President Correa's announcement to end the Yasui um, initiative, which was the innovative mechanism that was put into place by Korea um, to receive compensation, international compensation, uh, for the income of not, that was not received when they did not exploit oil resources, right? Um, so the Ecuadorian government essentially committed to leave almost 900 million barrels of oil underground and that they would essentially receive um, uh, money from international uh, funders, but only an estimated 50% of the actual value. So this was kind of a negotiation. He abandoned this. And so what has come out of this is that there's been um, a collective form to keep pushing government to not exploit um, that, um, that oil that is in that ecological reserve currently. Um, and what this really did um, is that it took, away, as a collective, it took away the attention off one specific organization, right? And so kind of trying to spread the responsibility of, quote, unrest across the masses or, or, or folks who, who were, were caring about this. It does not have legal status. And again, it's not associated to any organizational body. And this is a way in which they've used to, to get their message out without having government able to um, clamp down on them as an organization. OK. Finally, um, this seems intuitive. And I've already heard this happening in other contexts in the global north and global south, but building and leveraging local capacity. And I won't spend too much time on this, but um, when civil society wasn't getting answers from the national government and was feeling threatened by the national government, it simply started to focus more locally. And there were lots of projects in the 10 years of Korea using international funds and not um, that were focused on um, local governance. And so this is one which is um, the Ecuadorian Network of Fair, Democratic, and Sustainable Territories. 
And it developed a process to strengthen planning at the local government level, and really about that in, you know, sustainable development planning, thinking about um, the economic, the social, the environment, and the cultural, which I think um, Latin America does better than um, we do when thinking about sustainable development in the states, um, and really mobilizing local knowledge, right? And, um, and pulling in proposals from local civil society. And so there's some examples in the paper that we give about this, and this will continue to develop. The Confederation also, even though it is a na national level organization, has tried to focus on building capacity local, uh, focused on subnational federations in different locations, and also focused on funding streams from the EU to fund projects at the local level with civil society actors. So that being said, and I want to open it up for comments, um, again, kind of the paper then goes back to um, what does this look like or what can, these are the lessons that uh, we've identified that e Ecuadorian civil society organizations have learned and have continued um, to push through even and will do so with the new administration. Um, how can we put that in a framework of benefiting um, locations in, in the global north? And so, you know, I would argue in, in, in the paper that Ecuadorian CSOs have capacity and knowledge in these experience that really can help um, their northern partners and even other southern partners. And so that's kind of where the paper leaves off and leaves off with, we still don't know in the US context, because now the, the paper is pretty focused on what, um, the US can learn from Ecuador, but we might broaden it to more of a, a global north, but we don't know what's gonna happen still um, in the US. It is an unfolding story. So I'll leave it at that. I'd welcome.